Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Clifford Channon, Deputy Director of the 9-11 Museum, and on behalf of all of us, I'd like to welcome you to the museum's digital platform for the launch of our online public program series. Not surprisingly, given our name and the event the museum commemorates, we are particularly attentive to dates as the calendar turns each year. I'm Clifford Channon, Deputy Director of the 9-11 Museum, and, and on behalf of 2011, American Special Operators undertook flying into Pakistan, where American intelligence analysts thought that a large compound in the city of Abbottabad might be the hideout of Osama bin Laden. Not till those operators were landed at the compound, not till they fought their way to the third floor of the main building there, would they know whether the analysts were right. We know now that the analysts were indeed right. But finding that compound, deciding an assault would be worth the risk, and getting the team there was perhaps the highest stakes mission in the history of American special operations. Our museum is honored to tell this story through a special exhibition revealed the hunt for bin Laden. Like museums across the country, unfortunately, we're closed now. But until we can invite you back to the museum to see the exhibition, we do want to keep telling this remarkable story. And so we've turned to Robert Cardillo, who had a remarkable 35-year career in the American intelligence community, including a senior role in the Obama administration during the debate about what the U.S. should do about the lead to Abbottabad. I want to tell you a little bit about Robert's biography. Um, I've divided it with his permission into two parts because we're going to have two subjects in this conversation. Uh, from 1983 to 2010, so 27 years, Robert Cardillo worked at the Defense Intelligence Agency, beginning as an imagery analyst and ultimately rising to become the deputy director at DIA. In the fall of 2010, he was the first deputy director for intelligence integration at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence uh, under General Jim Clapper, who at roughly the same time started that job, I think a little bit uh, after Robert started. In that capacity, uh, he managed, edited, and delivered 1,400 of the president's daily briefs and worked with Director Clapper to reorganize and expand the functioning of the whole office. But really, it's the debate about the bin Laden mission based on the intelligence leads that emerge that we want to focus on to begin. But first, let me welcome you, Robert, and thank you very much for agreeing to launch this program with us. Oh, Cliff, um, I couldn't be more pleased to be here. It's really a privilege to be able to uh, either pressure or inform uh, the audience about the, the great teamwork uh, that resulted uh, in the successful you know, uh, rendering of justice to Osama bin Laden uh, nine years ago today. So couldn't be happier to be here. So it's, it's, it's um, in the fall of 2010, September 2010, that you begin your responsibilities uh, working uh, in ODNI, Director of National Intelligence. And it's at that point that the lead has already emerged, but it's at a White House meeting that you are first given a sense of what's going on. Can you take us to that moment and your impression of what the lead was when you first heard of it. Sure. And I do need to clarify one thing, Cliff, you said in the intro. Um, director Clapper became the Director of National Intelligence at the beginning of August in 2010, and I joined him about a month later. But very soon after I did, I was in the White House for a, a late afternoon meeting in the Situation Room. And as we were closing up that meeting, and I was preparing to go back to the office, uh, Mr. Panetta, Leon Panetta, who was then the uh, director of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, invited me to come upstairs with him and a, and a group of his analysts uh, to provide a briefing, an update to the president. And literally, Cliff, as I was walking upstairs, I didn't know what the topic was. I didn't know, you know, why I was being invited. But when the director of CIA invites you, you you exceed. And so uh, I wandered into the Oval Office and just took a position you know, somewhere out of the way because I knew you know, the analysts were going to uh, update the president. 
And that was the first time that I'd heard about the town of Adabad. Um, and um, clearly I was coming into the, I'll say, you know, not the first conversation. This was a, a refresh for the president and his senior leadership team. Um, and it was also clear to me, though, that it was early in its development. Um, there were more unknowns than knowns at that time. There were more questions than answers. And so it was, uh, I, I call it a framing session to give the president an update in early September about where the case was at that time. And so um, how can you describe the process that the president incited to get more information. What was the uh, impulse within the CIA and the other intelligence agencies? How were they driven to provide the information that the president was asking for? Well, let me start by saying some things that might be obvious, but they're worth reminding. You know, you know, some nine years before that September, you know, we had been attacked. The attribution for that attack you know, came pretty quickly and straightforwardly um, that bin Laden was behind it. And we, quite frankly, were bracing for additional attacks at that time. And obviously, it was there was no higher priority than bringing uh, he and the operators and the planners uh, to justice. Uh, and that was clear from day one. I think uh, I should also say, too, at the top that because I had the distinct privilege to, you know, to brief President Obama for four years in, in my position, uh, in my 36 plus years, I never met a better intelligence consumer. And what I mean by that, he was quite adept at ingestion, so very smart, very quick. Um, but where it made him uh, difficult to brief was where he would take the conversation. Um, um, it's quite good at finding weaknesses uh, in analytic theories, um, questioning assumptions, uh, making sure that we had uh, followed our tradecraft, et cetera. And then uh, on the other end of the analysis, President Obama was also quite gifted at asking the strategic implication question. Because Abbottabad, Abad, uh, as, as, as you already mentioned, is, is in Pakistan, and Pakistan's an ally. And, you know, one of the key questions was at the time, um, if it's the case that, that bin Laden was hiding in this residence outside of this uh, large city in Pakistan, was there awareness by Pakistani authorities? Um, was, if there was not uh, awareness, uh, what are the implications of uh, uh, consultation, operation, et cetera? And so, the president had a way of thinking both very narrowly on kind of the tactical case, you know, the, the specifics of the, of the pieces of intelligence that led to the final assessment, but also with the strategic framework that surrounded it. You know, what if, and what's the second order effect, what's the third order effect? All to say, a very demanding customer, very fair customer, but uh, the, the most demanding customer I ever worked for. It's interesting you refer to him as a customer. I, I've heard that reference in other conversations um, with the intelligence community, but it, it frames, in fact, the way that intelligence officers see their responsibility. They are providing a product, and it is called that at some point, to the person who is in a decision-making capacity. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to make this too simple, but, you know, if, if an intelligence professional's job is to scan the horizon, identify events, especially threats, before events dictate, so that you can give any decision maker time to be considered, to be deliberate, and ultimately make a decision that's you know in the advancement of their mission or cause or the outcome they seek. So I, I am comfortable with the word customer. Some of my colleagues aren't um, as, as, you know, don't like the phrase as much as I do. But I think of it as they're the decision maker. It's our job to raise their confidence, reduce their uncertainty at their point of decision. If we do that, then we and we do it, you know, professionally and following our tradecraft, we do everything we can. Um, we've done our job. 
um, we then turn over the really hard part of making the decision, whether that's a policy or an operational decision. But, but there is a line between the provision of the info and that, and then that ultimate decision. So track for us the development, if you would, sorry, um, the development, if you would, of the intelligence and the conviction as it emerged that this was a real lead, an important lead. And what were the constraints on the development of that intelligence? What were the limits of time or certainty or capacities that kept you as a collective from coming to a 100% determination and the tension between that gap in your knowledge and the need to act? Right. So it's a, it's a very detailed story. Um, um, Cliff, I'll keep it at the high levels and we can, we can go as deep as you or, or our audience would like. But uh, in broad terms, you, you know, we, we had um, an individual that uh, obviously had equally high interest in not being found. And so he and those that were supporting him were doing everything they could to, to um, minimize their signatures, to, uh, to, to close down on any communication or connectivity that might lead us to them. Um, you know, again, we, we're, we're nine years away from 9-11 at this point. Um, so he and his team had some practice here uh, with respect to achieving the outcome they sought, which was to con continue to evade U.S. intelligence and operational uh, effects, but you know, once the uh, the uh, we it, we began to have um, a nominated uh, target uh, location, um, the intel community then applies its tradecraft sources and methods, of course, which I won't go into detail on, but to seek to f first frame the picture. Because one of the key attributes of our tradecraft is establishing normalcy so that we can understand when something is abnormal. And, and as I said, obviously in this case, bin Laden and his team were trying to do just the opposite, to make sure that there was no abnormal activity, and that things uh, were uh, rendered um, without a, a signature. So uh, suffice to say, a very tough case. Um, uh, you know, the, the country, uh, our allies are very well served by the U.S. intelligence community. We've got a great history of tradecraft and teamwork. While you can imagine how closely held um, this analytical effort was because of the sensitivity and the risk of it becoming unknown. So uh, you can imagine that even within the compartmentation of the IC, which is quite good, this was very compartmented. Very few people were, were brought in. So that's a limitation um, in order to protect that sensitivity. Uh, on the other hand, because of the priority, um, you could apply every tool, every access, every opportunity that we, we may have. And uh, that certainly was the case here. Um, you know, Cliff, again, I was in the community for three and a half decades. Um, although it, the group was small, uh, I never saw better integration. There, there was, you know, zero issue about, you know, my agency versus your agency or my division and your division. A uh, unified effort uh, for a united outcome. Um, I'll close, though, by saying you said 100%. Um, this was not 100%. You know, this was an analytic judgment. Um, and there's actually been good reporting uh, in, in books uh, that have been written about, you know, did you think it was a 50% chance or a 60% chance or, or et cetera? And um, yes, occasionally uh, we get into those kinds of discussions to give, give a decision maker to let them know how confident you are in an assessment. Uh, but and one can argue whether or not it really was a 40 percent call or a 70 percent call, but it wasn't 100. Uh, it clearly was uh, um, uh, an estimate, uh, an assessment. Uh, and as others have noted, the president, you know, had to had to make that final determination himself, because you can imagine the implication if, if it was incorrect, uh, you would suffer all the consequences of moving into an ally's uh, airspace and operational uh, domain, violate sovereignty, and then not achieve your objective. So um, very, very gutsy call. 
We uh, spoke, and you were kind enough to uh, submit to an interview for the Bin Laden exhibition. And one of the things that struck me um, when we spoke, over these months where the intelligence is refining and deepening, but never quite getting to the certainty as you describe it, part of the process, and I think this is part of uh, general intelligence process, uh, regardless of the issue that's being considered, is providing alternate theories, pushing on the evidence and trying to see if the evidence that is supposed to show that bin Laden is there might also be explained by other scenarios. And that's sort of the way that different sets of ideas are matched up with one another and you can evaluate based on the outcome of those discussions, which is the stronger evidence in which direction. Um, can you describe that process? Because I know as, as things were winding towards a decision, the process of challenging the pro Bin Laden's in Abbottabad case seems to have intensified as a prelude to the ultimate decision being made. Yeah, yeah uh, Cliff, it's a great point. And it's a real risk in the intelligence profession. Um, just like I suppose in any profession where you've got to kind of persuade um, uh, for a certain outcome, there is a risk of getting too close to the problem. You know, you could be so invested in it and you could be so close to it that you would obviously want the outcome to be, in this case, that, that is bin Laden's location and we could at least provide an opportunity to do something about it. So a number of things were done in order to mitigate that risk, which is real within the profession. One is red team analysis. And so you take a, a separate group of analysts with the same sets of evidence, same sets of assessments, and you have, and who by the way, had no connection to the case, no knowledge of it at all. You segregate them and you ask them to go through it on their own. Okay, so these are different analysts with different levels of experience and obviously different perspectives. That was done. Um, that was done in the spring. Um, I want to say about the March timeframe um, of 2011. And, um, and that was very helpful because it, it exposed, you know, some weaknesses of where it may be assumptions that we thought, you know, were unquestionable. And we brought them back out to test the proposition again, maybe do a little bit more collection. Um, I'll have to say, Cliff, because, uh, you know, my role is Director Clapper's deputy was to sit on the deputies committee within the National Security Council. And there was a very small group that met periodically on just this topic. And again, very small group, very little notes taken during these meetings, obviously no attribution for the topic even because of the sensitivity. Um, but I found myself in those meetings as being that person, the one that would ask 18 questions about a new piece of intelligence or wondering, um, could this behavior be explained uh, an arms dealer who didn't want to be fined or a drug, you know, uh, uh, conveyor or somebody who was just hiding for whatever reason um, um, or asking the what if questions. Um, you know, I think it's well known that there there were a number of people that lived in that house. Uh, I think it's around 22 uh, in total. So family members, extended family members, and then, of course, his his support team. And I have to say that, you know, if you're hiding from, you know, the, the best intelligence service on the planet, that's 20, that's 21 weak links, if you know what I mean. Um, because, you know, each person is a vulnerability. And um, I recalling not being comfortable. I said, geez, there's just too many people in this house, you know, <laughs> uh, to, to make sense. Uh, now, again, uh, you know, for what it's worth, you know, ultimately, I agreed with the assessment, you know, that it was most likely that bin Laden was, in fact, hiding there. But I grew quite a reputation for being the one that would ask um, just one more question to make sure we had turned over and, uh, and, and challenged each of our assumptions. Take us to the critical moment of decision, if you would. The president has now gotten the intelligence. I think at a certain point, it became clear that the intelligence was not going to get better. And in fact, there was a concern either that the lead would leak or that 
by chance, bin Laden might realize he's being watched or even randomly just decide to move. So uh, the weather in Pakistan becomes a factor in terms of when the raid can go forward. So there's a moment where something has to be decided. And it's the president's decision, but his senior advisors are gathering with him to consider what that decision should be, make their recommendations, and wait for him to decide. Bring us up, please, to the culmination of this process, the decision-making you watched around the president, and the president himself as he considered what to do about this lead. Yeah, so now we're in the, uh, the third and the fourth week of, of April in 2011. And um, because, you know, it's incumbent upon the team to make sure the president has options, um, options were uh, presented, one being the, the raid that did occur. Uh, there were other options that were considered uh, as a, what we would call a standoff mission. So you would not employ boots on the ground or operators on the compound. You would use um, um, you know, weapons from a distance uh, to affect uh, the end result. Um, and of course, you had two other options. You could decide that the case was not strong enough or that the risks were too high, or you wanted you know, to, to take more time. So you know, doing nothing was an option, of course. Um, the, the president had given the order to prepare the options. Teams had done their preparations and rehearsals, so, so that was ready for him, uh, as well as the option to execute via a standoff uh, uh, manner. Um, but then it came down to decision. So this is now the week running up to what became the weekend of the operation. And the president held a number of meetings with his most senior team and uh, the room got a little bit more full towards the end because people had to be brought in uh, for good uh, advice and counsel for him um, but but it was not overly full if you must be there you were there um, and you know i didn't see a change as i said earlier cliff uh, he's very thoughtful in how he deliberates and i call him an ingester he just takes in information. Now, he will ask questions, but he just is kind of absorbing. So as I recall those meetings, he would go around. He, he would ask for the latest update on the intelligence, anything new, anything corroborative, corroborative or anything contravening a prior assessment that he had heard. And then he would go around his team, uh, you know, his most senior advisors of the National Security Council, whether that's Secretary of State, Defense, uh, Attorney General, Etc. cetera, uh, as national security advisors. And he would ask them about, you know, each of them, what, what they would think, uh, what they thought about it. And, and of course, these are very talented, thoughtful people who would tell them exactly what they thought. I mean, some were, uh, uh, well, every one of them had strong, strong views, but, uh, but he was in general. And, you know, he would question once in a while and he would just kind of absorb at the end of the table. And normally at the end of those meetings, he would give a little guidance, sometimes to Intel to see if, you know, we could maybe fine tune one thread or create one more opportunity for insight. Uh, more often than not, he was dealing with the, his, his military seniors to make sure things that were in place ready for any potential outcome. His diplomats would be ready for any potential um, scenario, et cetera. Um, uh, and then he would he would then leave the situation room and and again I think uh, convene with himself and a very small group of advisors. Um, as I recall the calendar, it was a Thursday night uh, of that week um, and the last week in April when he had his last meeting and people went around the room saying, you know, do you recommend you know no go option one or option two? And he heard from everyone in the room. And uh, as I recall, he left the room that night saying, I'll, I'll let you all know in the morning, uh, meaning Friday morning. And uh, we got the word. Um, I was out at the director of national intelligence office that next morning. The president decided to go ahead with the, um, the uh, on the ground option um, and that it would now occur um, that he would turn that mission over to the operators and they would decide when the best time was to execute. Uh, he had, they, they had a window already known 
That window was driven not just by weather, but moonlight conditions. Uh, the operators work best because they can work uh, uh, unseen with low moonlight conditions. That weekend was optimal for that. So that was not an accident. Um, so that should the president have made the decision, uh, both Saturday night, Pakistan time, uh, and Sunday night would have been optimum. Um, but then that decision got turned over basically to Admiral McRaven, uh, who was leading the team forward. Let me take then to the Sunday the 1st, and you are gathering in the Situation Room at the White House. The decision has been made to go forward. Admiral McRaven has delayed the mission from Saturday to Sunday because of weather and other conditions. Um, and so you begin to gather, and at this point, um, you are spectators, a very high level group of spectators, but nonetheless, as you say, this is now in the hands of the operators. Uh, it's a 90 minute or so flight uh, across to uh, into uh, Pakistan to Abbottabad for the Blackhawks bringing the SEALs to the mission. Um, you're there, you're able to uh, watch this and hear some of it. What, uh, what was that like? Bring us through the story and particularly, of course, the moment that everybody knows uh, when you're watching and yet one of the helicopters, the first one on the scene, has problems and falls to the earth. Please. Um, so first of all, let me say that because, you know, Saturday night was okayed as well, you know, we first went in on Saturday morning, again, Washington time, believing that we needed to be ready for a mission that went that night. Um, I don't recall the exact time. I want to say it was early afternoon, our time, when we heard that the Admiral had decided to slide the mission 24 hours. So there was a sense of, okay, we got ready on one day, uh, again, to be observers, but got ready. And then we went back in on Sunday morning. Um, there was an eerie calm. Um, and I mean that in a good way, Cliff. Um, you know, we felt like we'd done our work. We had made the best case. We had presented the president with, you know, the strongest assessment that we could. People were in place. We had the most professional operational force ready to go. And so there was a, I think, I felt at least a calm. I mean, obviously, there was an anxiety about, is the assessment right? You know, will the mission go well, et cetera? But there was, uh, I think, a strange calm that went with that confidence. Um, you're correct. Uh, Washington time uh, would have been 1 p.m. early afternoon is when the helicopters would have uh, taken off from their base uh, and began their flight. And as you said, it was a 90 minute flight. And um, uh, I recall, you know, getting more anxious at the time because you're now into the zone where things can go wrong and uh, um, um, that have nothing to do with the intelligence assessment, just have to do with with life and, and how things work. And as you describe, uh, well, I, guess, I first, I guess I should say that there, there was connectivity, um, you know, back to both and then to the Pentagon and then over to the White House um, to keep us informed about and to keep the president informed, most importantly, about how the mission was going. And um, so as we gathered in that small room, um, you know, the famous photo, uh, it, it obviously got pretty full as people began to gather to get the most direct uh, information we could get. As you said, uh, two helicopters approached the site. Um, the first helicopter was uh, mission was to do perimeter security. And so it landed, deployed its forces, and they began to do their job just to make sure that the site was secured around uh, it, the local area. Uh, and then the second helicopter was its mission was to actually execute the assault. Uh, that mission was planned to be a direct access to the compound, to the house itself, uh, via a fast rope. Um, as you said, uh, that helicopter uh, had an issue with lift, let's put it mildly, and had what I think is technically called a hard landing um, uh, right next to the house um, on the compound, but actually had two walls between it and the house at that point. Um, can I say that? Uh, uh, that pilot performed an extraordinarily heroic uh, mission in, in, in having that very difficult landing 
but without casualties and obviously without uh, impeding the mission. Of course, when we were informed about that, you know, at the White House, um, I'll just speak for myself, racing through my mind is the country's experience with tragedies during operations like this when one considers helicopters. And whether you go back to Desert One uh, in the attempt to rescue our hostages in Tehran back in 1979-80, or if you go to Somalia and the issues with the Blackhawks uh, that went down in Mogadishu, and, and remember, Cliff, when we got the word that the helicopter had gone down, we didn't know two important things. We didn't know if anyone had been hurt, much less killed. Uh, a crash is a crash, and, and there's a lot of kinetic uh, materials on these helicopters. And two, we still didn't know if bin Laden was in the home. And so it, uh, I'll just say in my head, I'm racing through you know, we've got SEALs in harm's way now. They're on the ground. We don't know how they are at this second. And and we may or may not be right about why we put them there, right? So it was a very tense a few moments. And I say a few moments because, you know, in my head, it felt like hours. And I know it was only seconds between the time of, of knowing that the helicopter went down and hearing Admiral McRaven come over uh, the um, uh, the communications line uh, in his very calm Texas draw saying that we will now amend the mission. And he was so confident and so calm that it helped me breathe again because I said, oh, my goodness, we have <laughs> real professionals. They know how to deal with adversity and they'll figure this out. And uh, indeed, they did. The call came in after that, just moments later or minutes later, I should say. Uh, Geronimo, that the code for bin Laden being there was spoken by the ground force commander and communicated onward uh, by Admiral McRaven. I wonder, having been in the depths of despair at the possibility that there had been this cataclysmic crash of a helicopter, we moved past that, and then all of a sudden you have the confirmation not just of the intelligence analysis, but the actual fact of bin Laden having been there. What about that mood shift? So, yes, it, it was a moment. Now, again, I want to say the probably the actual time delta between second helo goes down, Admiral McRaven declares mission amendment, and Geronimo, probably 10 to 12 minutes. So, I mean, it was, they still had to get from where they were, again, through two walled uh, fences or uh, uh, walled barriers, um, had a firefight in the courtyard because there were um, um, guards uh, there that, that they had to deal with and then work their way in and now up the house, three floors to the, where the assessment was that he lived and it turned out to be there. You're correct. That as that evolved, um, Admiral McRaven came back on. It's my memory that he put the caveat before he informed the Geronimo call. And it was something like this it was, um, okay, I'm about to tell you something, but I also need to remind you that these operators are, are hyped up right now. They've just been in a, you know, a firefight, tough combat, adrenaline is flowing, and they have passed back the word that they believe that they have secured the objective and declared drama. So what he was saying is, yes, they've declared it, but let's be sure. OK, so um, um, it was it was a it was a declaration with a caveat, uh, but it still felt pretty good, especially when we got the answer to the first part that that no seals had been you know, injured and or you know, killed in the in the crash or the operation. Tell me just, just the, the, the move of the SEALs uh, then back, unless it's a whole other set of concerns, because if they manage to get in quietly, they've blown up the helicopter that crashed to protect the technology on it. Um, other helicopters have come in to pick them up. Um, if they've gone in quietly, they're not getting out quietly. And from what we understand, the Pakistanis are now aware that something is going on that shouldn't be going on in their country. 
So the anxiety of uh, the mission is not complete until they're back in Afghanistan and everybody's got to wait 45 minutes or whatever it is for this to happen. Uh, tell us what that was like. Yeah, you're exactly right. Like, so um, declaration is made. Um, uh, additional helo arrives to extricate um, uh, the seals and they begin to egress um, just after the explosion of the downed helicopter because of the sensitive materials that was contained there. And um, you're right, um, so much for secrecy at that point, very large explosion. Um, there was a military garrison not that far away. So Pakistan is now alert and, and reacting. And uh, I could be wrong, but I wanna say about a 45 minute flight, it could have been a little longer, maybe closer to an hour before they clear Pakistani airspace. So for me, I'm not fully um, um, comfortable until I hear Admiral McRaven declare we've cleared uh, Pakistani airspace. And yeah, those were some tense moments because again, another accident could happen. Uh, it was always a possibility. Um, or two, the, the Pakistani reaction could have resulted in some sort of forced uh, a force engagement, um, which again, fortunately did not happen. Let me ask a couple of questions have come in and they're sort of opposite sides of a coin. Uh, the first, William Raff, one of our docents and uh, great supporters of the museum wants to know, is there any evidence that Bin Laden expected this or was anticipating being uh, the subject of an American raid and whether or not he was being protected in some way. And then we have similar questions from Gordon Haberman, who, whose daughter Andrea was killed on 9-11, um, asking, was there evidence at any point that the Pakistanis knew that bin Laden was there? And Christy uh, asks this as well. Um, both sides of that, bin Laden's awareness of his vulnerability and vulnerability to an American raid or attack and the Pakistanis and what their role was in bin Laden having been hiding in their country for many years. Yeah, you, uh, I mean, I'm gonna give you this, this analyst view, Cliff, um, which is uh, one, I would suspect that bin Laden was probably preparing at some point mentally that you know he was, his run was going to end. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence that he thought it was there on the third floor on that night um, uh, that it was going to happen. I'm, I'm sure had he had any alert, he would have changed uh, his location. Um, we did worry um, because of experience that we'd had in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan that the house could have been wired for such an eventuality. And you know, the, in some cases, uh, a terrorist figure would wear a suicide vest um, for just that reason, so that they couldn't be taken alive and so that they could create, you know, even more damage if cornered. Um, uh, but beyond that, um, we had an experience with entire homes that had been wired for just such an effect. Um, because we had done detailed analysis of the construction of that house over time, and uh, which includes, you know, my former agency, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which did that historic work. Uh, we were pretty confident um, that that was not the case. So that leads me to believe that I don't think he thought he was particularly vulnerable there or at that time. Um, you could debate the latter question for a long time. Um, you know, I've had colleagues who have said, um, given how long he was there, and it was not months, it was years, and given the nature of the Pakistani state that they have, good access to the people and good ability to monitor activity that it's hard to believe uh, that, that uh, Pakistani authorities weren't aware. Um, I don't believe it was the case. Certainly, I don't believe that the state knew, okay? Can I tell you definitively that no one, you know, in the Pakistani hierarchy knew and might have been helping with his protection or et cetera? That I could find more plausible, but I, I do doubt that it was at the state level. Um, I, I think he was successfully even hiding, uh, quote, in plain sight from them. 
One more on, on this question, and then we're going to shift. Um, and we have a question from Lucien, which is the summary question. What's the takeaway? What's the lesson learned? Why was this important? Well, um, think back, you know, to that September morning um, in 2001. And, you know, not just our country, uh, our capital, uh, um, you know, New York City was attacked that morning, but our way of life was attacked that morning. And you think of the shock that the country and, and our allies uh, went through, and not to mention even the devastation of those who had personal loss um, on that day. Um, the lesson for me is to show what this country can do when it unites behind an objective and it drops the um, um, the barriers and the inhibitors to cooperation uh, and to collective outcome. And as I said at the outset, I was I've never had the privilege of being involved with anything, Cliff, that was more uh, cooperative um, and single minded in outcome. And so to me, yes, there was the absolute need to bring bin Laden to justice. And so that was done in, in some way, you know, hopefully provided some closure uh, to the families and the loved ones. But two, the other thing I can take away is that we can do everything, uh, anything, if we are, again, properly motivated and, and kind of collectively engaged. And I think that's an important reminder for us all, especially as we now live through a different kind of trauma, uh, albeit a more slow moving one. Let me shift a little bit. And we um, spoke about this. I'm going to bring back your biography a little bit and uh, the career because you mentioned the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, you left the Office of Director of National Intelligence to become the NGA director in October 2014. And I do want to Parenthetically, thank you, because in your capacity as NGA director, you were the one who approved the loan of the compound model for the exhibition. So we are truly in your debt. It's as if the Queen of England had lent us the crown jewels. I really do understand that. And for our audience to know, um, the compound model is uh, uh, occupies uh, uh, a spot outside the director's office. So anybody coming to visit the director of NGA would normally see the compound model. So lending it to us actually took it out of a critical location where the whole history and quality of the organization is kind of summarized. So again, Robert, thank you. October 2014 to February 2019, you are running um, NGA. And as we described it before, um, the relevance to today's uh, COVID problem goes back to late 2013 when the intelligence community is beginning to focus on the emergence of a new disease, deadly, in Africa spreading, Ebola. And you move over to run one of the key American intelligence agencies that is now, of course, with everything else it's doing, um, all the other problems in the world, now really beginning to focus on this health crisis. So tell us a little bit, please, about NGA. I'm not sure people know very well what it does but also the role of the intelligence community more broadly, not just NGA, but all of the agencies, and how they engage with a pandemic disease problem that we're facing now, but has been faced before. Yeah, I'm happy to. And I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit about you know, why uh, NGA exists and what service it provides as I recount the experience I had in contributing to the fight uh, to uh, defeat uh, the Ebola threat. So uh, NGA's motto uh, is nine words, um, uh, but frames uh, its service. Um, uh, know the earth, uh, show the way, and understand the world. The know the earth part is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it is the planet that we live on, it's the geography, it's the hydrography, uh, it's the magnetic fields, it's everything to do uh, with uh, the reality of the, of the planet. And it includes those man-made features that are on top of it. Because 
we have to have that reference frame. And NGA has world-class scientists and geologists and geodesists who understand the planet in a way so that we can do the second job, which is show the way. Um, and that is safe navigation, um, predominantly for the U.S. Department of Defense and its allies. But because the U.S. Department of Defense uh, sometimes needs to go everywhere around the planet, it, it, it is the whole planet. And uh, and so whether it's aeronautic navigation or maritime uh, domain awareness or land uh, movement, NGA has expertise to make sure that those things are happening safely. There's a carryover effect from that uh, cliff to the civilian world. So civilian airliners will use NGA materials to safely navigate uh, from one airport to another. Uh, the last one is the hard one. Um, understand the world uh, because, you know, you throw humans into the mix and uh, people that are trying to hide things uh, somewhere on or underneath uh, the surface uh, and you get to the analytic mission. Um, so with respect to Ebola, you know, I was sworn in in early October. Um, President Obama had by that time declared Ebola to be a national security imperative which meant that, and also included as his, with his commander-in-chief role, he, he directed the movement of the 101st Airborne Division uh, from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, to uh, Liberia. Now, it, it wasn't a military mission. It was really a logistics, a medical logistics mission, because they were there to create the infrastructure and, 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 and movement capacity to enable what was needed, medical treatment to those who had the symptoms. And, and while the disease is different than COVID-19, um, uh, it's, it's, it was actually more deadly if caught, but it was less easy to transmit. It was still highly dangerous to the people of Liberia because of how they were living and where they were living. And so two important things had to be done rather quickly. One, you had to move from symptom to diagnosis in the shortest period of time. Because once you got diagnosis and, and it was Ebola, they, there had to be immediate isolation and treatment. And two, because of the contagion factor, you had to separate those that didn't have the, didn't have the disease. Well, all of that is done through geospatial information and services because you, you need to know what the road and rail infrastructure or, or just uh, foot movement sometimes between these villages is uh, something that we would call human geography, which means understanding both the societal effects and the cultural effects that cause people to, you know, live in one place. And some people will go to a medical, uh, you know, clinic and some people won't, and perhaps with religious beliefs. So um, understanding that kind of layer of information was also important. And the last thing NGA did was share its data. So whether it was Doctors Without Borders or World Health Organization or, you know, Centers for Disease Control, they needed to have access to NGA's geospatial stores, its maps, its charts, et cetera, on these devices, you know, whether that be a laptop or a smartphone. That wasn't something we were adept at doing in 2014. Now, NGA is much better at it today and, quite frankly, getting better at it all the time, given the virtual work we're all doing. But it was really a formative experience for us to go through that um, and, and really bring what had been kind of hidden close out into the open uh, where it was needed. So there's a whole range of... of information that the intelligence community is looking at, and you've described NGA's role in particular. Um, can we fast forward to the COVID crisis? Because uh, there have been reports of uh, early uh, intelligence community focus on what was going on in Wuhan, the emergence of, of COVID. Um, tell us what the various agencies might be doing under these circumstances to figure out what's going on. What are they looking for? What means do they use to find these things? So I'll go back to the basics, Cliff. Uh, that is, um, you have to understand normal before you can understand the absence of normal or, or, or something untoward. And so understanding a pattern of life, in this case, it's a medical or biological pattern of life is critical. Um, I would also say, too, just as it was in the Ebola fight, 
Um, this is what we might call a non-traditional intelligence problem. Okay, it's it's not you know a, a foreign navy or an air force. Right, it's a it's a, it's a it's a biological um, uh, element that that it provides or presents a threat um, to our way of life, different kind of threat. And so, just as under Ebola, what's required here is a kind of a non-traditional teaming arrangement. Um, now, I'm a former government official. I can't attest to what is or isn't working on that side. Um, uh, I do know that uh, my experience, whether it goes back to Hurricane Katrina and uh, what uh, you know NGA did in that regard, um, or um, or in the Ebola crisis, um, I would know that those kinds of services about frames of reference, patterns of activity, anything that would tip a question as to you know why something happened or why something didn't happen would be to would, would would be my view what the intelligence community could add to the question about origin or pattern or you know future movement. So um, there is in the uh, current uh, state of knowledge about um, COVID um, reporting as of today. Uh, regarding the intelligence community's assessment that, as far as they can tell, the scientific consensus that COVID-19 is not man-made um, or not genetically modified. Um, and at the same time, uh, a focus by the intelligence community on the lab in Wuhan, which does virology work in China. Um, and the president's uh, statement that he has information that leads him to think that this is uh, a man-made outcome. So help us understand that. And in particular, I want to know what does that do to the intelligence community if their um, conclusions and their work are not being taken seriously or not being taken as the best analysis that they can make? So state the obvious, I'm on the outside now, looking in just as you are, Cliff, but I'll give you my view. So first, you know, and I had a lot of experience with President Obama and his team. Um, let me just say there there exists a natural tension uh, between um, an intelligence professional's view of the world and any president's view of the world. And and I'll say that because it's it makes sense. Presidents and policymakers see the world as they want it to be or wish it to be or see the outcome as 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 they would want. Uh, intelligence professionals are you know pretty straight down in the middle, and they just describe the world as it is. And those two things are can be in conflict. So tension is normal. Um, I will observe that the tension is is extraordinary these days. Um, uh, so and that you know can vary from president to president. Here, here's what I would want you and, and, and those viewing to be confident in. Um, I have enough experience with the professionals that I serve with and I know that serve today. They will continue to do their job, apply their tradecraft, uh, strictly enforce the methodology that and the training that they use and stick to uh, the facts as they know them. If that meets, you know, either, um, let me say, if, if that somehow contradicts with the view of a policymaker, again, that can happen. Uh, what I want the viewers to be to know is that, that I know the intelligence professionals that continue to serve will, will, will continue do their and continue to provide uh, that truth as best they know it, as best they know it, um, to those powers that be. One uh, last question. We're running short on time from Ruth. Uh, I know you've expressed uh, uh, concern about the balance between what we need to know under uh, this kind of COVID circumstance, the new technology that may allow us to do all kinds of tracking and tracing that's being done in other countries and what uh, that might pose is by way of challenge to our civil liberties. How do you see this extraordinary technology and the information it can provide balanced against the, the most basic American rights uh, and freedoms? Um, well, that's really a difficult closing question. It's the exact one to close on, but it's, it's tough to summarize. I, let me say this, Cliff. One, um, I'm convinced that the world is becoming more transparent and more connected, uh, whether that's our phones or our, our devices. Um, um, 
there are just more sensors and more sensing going on all the time. Uh, most of that we hit accept on our phones because it provides us with an advantage. I can, I can commute more efficiently. I can find a consumer product that I'm looking for uh, more effectively. But I get the reticence to when that information about my location and my activity could be shared with an institution or an element of government that could potentially harm me. Um, either my liberty or my freedom or my uh, sense of privacy, as you said. So my hope, my desire, and one thing I'm trying to do in this chapter uh, of, of my career is elevate this conversation. Um, um, and I don't say that if we elevate it, we'll all agree on where the line is. I just believe that if we expose more of what's possible what can and can't be done with the information, who will have access and for what reason, I think we can find a place where we could find, I'll say, a rough balance between those two imperatives of security, and security in this case is health security, right, so that we're all more protected from, from a virus. More protected from a virus. Personal privacy and, and, uh, and the civil liberties, which we value uh, just as much. So uh, elevating the conversation, I think, is the, is, the, uh, is the way forward, Cliff. Let me just follow up very quickly, because there is very little time. Is the tendency, though, towards, because so much more information is being generated, is it inevitable that this is simply going to be the case, that more is known about us regardless of what we want, simply because of our reliance on technology? So I happen to believe that, Cliff. I, 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 think, I think it's just... I think the, just the, the way that technology is heading, and, and quite frankly, I think mostly driven by commercial interests. Um, this is not some you know, government plot. This is, this is commerce trying to become more efficient, more competitive, et cetera. Um, but I also have this, I'm, I'm an optimist, Cliff. I also believe that transparency is at the end of the day good for I'll say, you know, liberal democracies. And I mean that in an apolitical sense. What I mean is, is that if you can respect human rights, you can respect privacy and be transparent. And, and, and as long as the transparency includes what the government's up to, okay, what the, uh, the arresting officials are up to, what the, um, you know, if you will, the kind of the darker sides, I think the more light we can shine, I think, the better we can be. I think mutual understanding can lead to, you know, or let me put it another way, mutual perspective or, 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 or view can lead to mutual understanding, mutual awareness. Doesn't always have to lead to some agreement at the end of that, um, but that's where civil discourse comes in. And that's where, you know, this country has thrived with, you know, thoughtful um, uh, views being competed, to, you know, in the public square. And I think that's what we need to do here. Thank you, Robert. Before we go, I'm going to take a moment and um, ask our viewers to consider um, uh, whether they might be willing to support these kinds of programs that we're doing. I know we are in a time of difficulty and there are many, many causes that uh, have a legitimate claim on your attention. Uh, we would ask as well that you consider the museum as well. Um, we have closed and so uh, we're continuing to build our program platform digitally now and Robert Cardillo is our a maiden voyage into this realm. And we thank you, Robert, very much. Uh, but I would ask our uh, friends out there to consider supporting the museum on this occasion, um, encouraging further programming that we will be doing. Uh, we've been speaking today with Robert Cardillo, who was the sixth director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, having been in the office of the director of national intelligence as deputy director, same title at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time and for offering your wisdom and insight to us. I've enjoyed the conversation, Cliff. It's great to be associated with such an important institution. You all, you do wonderful work and, uh, and I wish you the best. Thank you so much. We'll be back, everybody. Stay tuned. <laughs>